From time to time, we all do stupid things. Some do more stupid things than others. And, and you know, I'm not one to embarrass people. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I'd rather be telling this on somebody else than myself this morning. But I did something really, really stupid yesterday. And I thought you might like to hear about it since I have a tendency to squeal on other people. Deb and I uh, and the family, we we had a wedding out of town that we had to to go to. And uh, so we decided, Jeremy and Lisa and and their kids, they went the day before, but, but Mike and Hannah and their family and, and Deb and I, we decided that we would drive together to save on gas. And So uh, what we did was we decided that we would meet at their house at 6.30 in the morning. And so we got up, got all ready to go. And, and I, I mentioned to Deb, I said, hey, why don't we stop and buy the kids some donuts or something before we, you know, go over there. So... We, we stopped at Dunkin' Donuts, pulled in through the drive-thru. I ordered a, a box of those round munchkins, okay? Everything was going great, man. We were looking forward to this great day, whatever. And lady said it would be, I don't know, $7 and something. And that was no problem. Pulled up to pay, handed the lady the money. She handed the change back to me. I said, thank you. She said, you're welcome. I handed the money over to Deb, I raised my window, and we was gone. We get all the way out to jams, and Deb says, hey, where are the donuts? (laughs) Needless to say, we did a circle there and came all the way back, went through the drive-thru again, and I said, Ma'am, I'm here to pick up my munchkins. She said, pull around. (laughs) Pulled around and I looked at her and I said, I hope this isn't going to be an indication of how my day's going to go. She just laughed and we took off. So, talk about feeling kind of dumb. You been there? That has absolutely nothing to do with my sermon this morning, but I thought you might like me to just tell that story about myself. Like I said, I wish it was on somebody else. I'd have really have, I'd lived to that one. But anyhow, it's fun to be able to laugh at yourself, isn't it? I want to speak to you this morning on living above the snake line. I don't know about you, but I do not like snakes. Anybody here like snakes? That figures, Mary Jo, you would. (laughs) I, (laughs) I dislike them. And I think the reason I probably dislike them is because they're where you don't expect them to be, aren't they? And it's kind of like, whoa, there's a, there's a snake, you know. And, uh, but I, I don't like them. They curl up, they hiss, they can bite, and uh, they can even cause death. But I've read recently that the early American settlements, the early settlers, when they went out west, they referred to the snake line. Do you know there is in nature a line drawn, it's an invisible line, that snakes will not pass. And they call it the snake line. And the early settlers always wanted to settle above the snake line. They wanted to build their cabins above the snake line. Now they knew that the fertile plains was better 
more fertile. But they also knew that if they went and they lived below the snake line, that they had more of a chance of getting bit by a rattlesnake or a copperhead. And so they always wanted to build above the snake line. Just as God has drawn an invisible line in the, in the high lands that snakes can't pass, there's a spiritual snake line as well. There is a level of living that God wants us to live at. It's above the world. There is a lifestyle of living that God made available to us that allows us to live a holy, righteous, and godly life. This lifestyle sets us free from many of the problems of the world. Proverbs says, chapter 13, verse 15, The way of the unfaithful is hard. The way of the unfaithful is hard. My text this morning, or my scripture lesson, is taken from the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Chapter 1, beginning with verse 9. And it says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with all knowledge of His will, through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That is some awesome scripture full of of wonderful things that I want to share with you. But remember the story of Abraham and Lot? In the story of Abraham and Lot, they had prospered and God was blessing and things were going well for them. And they got big. They grew. Their possessions grew. And their herdsmen began to to fight and argue with one another. And Abraham said, it's time that we split. And so he called Lot together and he said, you know, before we have any big blow-ups, before we have any contention coming between us, why don't we split our families? You take your possessions and you take your cattle, your sheep, your herdsmen's, And you pick any part that you want. And he said, I'll give you the choice. And he said, I'll go in the opposite direction. And so Lot, he looked. And he looked at the fertile lowlands. And he seen that it was well watered. And it was well fertile. Fertile. And he said, I'll take the plains. I'll take the lowland. And so he chose that, and and Abraham, he said, fine, I'll take the highlands. I'll take the other land. And we know from that story that Lot lived too close to the world. He lived below the snake line, so to speak, that spiritual snake line. And we also know that it ended up being his destruction. And whenever people live below that snake line, their life is headed for destruction. You see, we as Christians have been elevated. 
We have been elevated above that snake line. God does not want us to live in the land of danger. The Word of God teaches us that there are two types of people in the world. There are those that have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And there are those that are lost. Now we know from Scripture that Romans tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every one of us. Every one of us, we, we've, we've lived below the snake line. We have all lived that sinful life. All have sinned. We have all come short to the glory of God. In the book of Ephesians it says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who now is at work in those who are disobedient. And what he's saying to us is there was a time in our lives when, when we've all been there. We have all lived in sin. We were all lost. We all lived below the snake line. The wonderful thing is we don't have to stay below the snake line. But by the grace of God we can be elevated above that spiritual snake line. And we don't have to live in the world or it live, live like the world lives. But we can live above that lifestyle. The world teaches, or the word teaches us that every lost person lives below the spiritual snake line. The sinner shows it every day by the way they live and act. Remember in the book of Numbers, chapter 21? The children of Israel were griping, complaining. They weren't happy with their leaders. They weren't happy with Moses. They weren't happy with God. They got tired of the food that they were eating and they began to gripe and they began to complain. Remember what God did? He caused snakes to come. Poisonous snakes. And the snakes began to bite them and they began to die. And, and it, was, it, was a, it was a terrible, terrible plague. Many had lost their lives. And the people went to Moses and they said, Pray, Moses, pray. Ask God to turn the, the serpents away from us. God was punishing them with the snakes. You know, the sinner has been bitten by the serpent of sin. And it will eventually destroy them if they don't repent. The lowland of sin is a place of spiritual poverty. It is a place of hopelessness, sorrow, lostness. And despair. It is a place of broken hearts and shattered dreams and ruined relationships and troubled minds. All of us perhaps have relatives or we know of people that live below that snake line and their lives are ruined. They live in despair every day, in heartache. They have nothing to live for. Hope is gone. Dreams are a thing of the past. How sad. How sad. That's no life for us. God wants to elevate us above that lifestyle, above that spiritual snake line to a higher life. For the person who has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they've been elevated. It is a place of spiritual rest. It is a place of comfort and joy and happiness. It is a place of spiritual security and hope. And I want to get into the heart of, of the scripture here. I want you to notice the language that Paul uses. In verse 12, he says basically that God is our Father. God is our Father. If we have been elevated above that spiritual snake line, God becomes our Heavenly Father. 
And it is awesome to be adopted into the family of God. Think about it. If your life has been elevated above that snake line this morning, and if you can honestly say that God is my heavenly Father, you are adopted into God's awesome family. And along with that comes wonderful, wonderful privileges. Your name has been written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. And as an adopted child of God, you have all the the benefits of heaven and all that it has to offer. I also want you to notice in verse 12, he says, we have been made or meet to be partakers in the inheritance of the saints of light. You have been elevated. You have been able to call God your father. You have been adopted into the family of God and you have been given an inheritance. Your name has been written down on the deed. Think about it. Your name has been written down on the deed. Your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. What does that mean? That means that you and I, when this world comes to a close, and someday it will for each and every one of us, whether by death or whether through the resurrection, we are going to be with our Heavenly Father forevermore. And we are going to experience all the joys and the glory of heaven. It is going to be an amazing, an amazing place. I have a friend in Kentucky he, uh, he's a friend of the family. He, he uh, was a retired principal from one of the schools down there. He, uh, him and his wife, and he, he took a couple of his grandkids with him. His son has bought a big touring bus. Gorgeous. Beautiful. And I think his son is paying for the whole trip. They took 20 days to go out west. And he's been documenting his journey. And it's been amazing. Taking trips or taking pictures and, and uh, documenting. We went here, we went there, this is what we've seen. And showing us the pictures and the journey. And he is seeing some awesome, awesome sights. Went through Yellowstone just the other day and showed the, the, the many sights. Went through the national parks and showed the, the pictures and what, what, what a gorgeous, gorgeous country we live in. But I want to tell you something. It's not going to come close to what heaven is going to be like. It's not going to come close to what heaven is going to be like. And if we can call God our Father, We've been adopted into his great family. We are partakers, or we'll be partakers of the inheritance that he has given unto us. The next thing I want you to notice is we have been delivered from the power of darkness. In verse 13, we have been delivered from the power of darkness. I don't know about you, but darkness is something I don't particularly like. It's okay at nighttime (laughs) when you want to sleep. But if you had to live in darkness for days and days and days, you would go mad. In fact, they, they claim that in Alaska, many have gone mad because of the darkness. What is it, six months of darkness or something that they have up there? Makes people go crazy. We have been delivered from the darkness of sin. God has set us free. Verse 13 also says, We have been translated or carried away into the kingdom of His dear Son. He carried us out of the lowland of sin and the power of darkness and placing us into His great 
family with all of its privileges. Verse 14, it tells us that we have redemption through his blood. Redemption through his blood. You know, I've recently in my devotions have been reading in the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews talks about the old order. It deals with uh, some of the old ways that they had done, and, and uh, they were addressing some of that, uh, on, and in how it, it never brought real satisfaction. It was a ritual that they had to go through. They had to kill the, the lamb, and they had to put it on the, the altar of sacrifice, and the priest had to, to do all kinds of things and rituals that they went through to do all that. And when it was all said and done, it never changed the lives of the individuals. But in this new order, we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We don't have to go through the rituals. We don't have to go and watch a priest kill a lamb or whatever the case might be and, and offer a sacrifice for our sins. We have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, the Son of God. And it's through His blood that we find redemption. And then the last point he makes here in verse 14 is we have forgiveness of sin. He has removed our sins from us, never to be remembered against us again. You know the sins that you've committed? Lying, stealing, cheating, and some worse than that. The hang-ups that you've had, those bad habits that you were involved in. They are forgiven. They are totally wiped away. And the amazing thing is, you may not be able to forget them. I want to tell you something. God doesn't remember them. He chooses not to remember. As far as the east is from the west, he has removed our transgressions from us. And so whatever it was that you were involved in, it's, it's gone. It's forgiven. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Never to be remembered against us. If you have been saved, you have been elevated to a higher plane. You no longer live in the lowlands of sin and destruction. We have been enlightened above the snake line. We have been enlightened above the snake line. When we become children of God, we become the children of light. We no longer walk in darkness, but we walk in newness of life. We become enlightened by the full knowledge of His will through spiritual wisdom and understanding. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, for he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. In other words, the man who is living below the snake line is living in darkness and he cannot understand the things of the Spirit. And you see, those in the world can't understand why you do the things that you do, why you, why you go to church on a Sunday morning, why you give to the offering, why you've given to God your heart and your life, why you don't run in the bars and, and why you don't live a, a wild life and why you don't, according to them, have fun. But they have no idea what fun really is, do they? They can't understand that because they are living in darkness. They are spiritually blind. But you and I, we have been enlightened we who live above that spiritual snake line know why we do the things we do. Because we're not in love with the world. We're not in love with the pleasures of the world. We are in love with the Almighty. 
We know that we are a part of God's family. And we want to please Him. And we want to be obedient to Him. Because we know that our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And we have a great inheritance awaiting us. Once a little girl was playing in the yard when she stopped and examined the flowers in her mother's uh, flower garden. And she said, Mom, Mom, I know why flowers grow. The mom thought, I wonder what she's going to say. And so she said, why? And she said this. Because they want to get out of the dirt. They want to get out of the dirt. You know why you and I live above the snake line? Because we want to get out of the dirt. We want to get out of that old lifestyle. That old way of the world. And we want to rise above that. And then... The third point is simply this. We have been empowered above the snake line. We have been empowered above the snake line. Not only have we been elevated and enlightened, but we have been empowered above the snake line. In verse 11, it tells us that we are strengthened by His power to give us endurance and patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. I want to tell you something, church. It's awesome to know that the Almighty can empower us to live a victorious Christian life. We are empowered. The power is there for our availability if we just take it to live above that snake line. Let me close with this story. An old farmer one day was out in his fields and he he found a a little baby eagle that was hurt. And he wasn't exactly sure what to do with it, and so he decided to take it and uh, and he put it with his chickens. And uh, he just left it there and it began to grow and the chickens and, and the eagle got rather friendly and... It just walked around and did what the chicken did. In fact, he noticed that in no time at all, the the eagle began to imitate the chickens. And finally, the wing of the eagle began to heal. And the farmer thought, you know, it's time that I take this eagle and I teach it to fly. And so he, he put the eagle in a bag and he got in his old pickup truck with the eagle and he went to a, to a high mountain that was on his farm up on a, up on a hill. And, and there on this, this hill, he decided that instead of throwing the eagle right off the, the hill there, that he would experiment a little bit and try to build the eagle's wing up a little bit. And, and so he took the eagle out of the bag and he said to the eagle, He said, now, eagle, you're not a chicken. You're an eagle, and you must fly. And he took the eagle, and he threw the eagle up in the air, and it it flapped its wings a little bit, and it, it fluttered to the ground. He went over, and he picked the eagle up again. And this time, he, he, he got up on a fence post, a little bit higher, as he was standing on this fence post, he, he looked at this eagle and he said to the eagle, you're not a chicken, you're an eagle and you must fly. And he took the eagle and he threw it up in the air and the eagle flapped its wings and it fluttered to the ground. And the third time he went over to the eagle and he picked it up. And this time he walked a little bit higher to the edge of the the knoll there that he was on. And with that eagle in his hands, he said, no eagle. He said, you're no chicken. You are an eagle. And eagles fly. So you must fly. And with all of his might, he took that eagle and he threw it up in the air. And the eagle began to flap its wings. 
and it caught the wind and the eagle began to soar. You know, God says to us today, you're not a chicken. You're an eagle. And you need to fly. You, you really need to fly. Over in the book of Isaiah, it says this, He gives strength to the weary and increases power to the weak. Even youth grow weary or tired and weary. And young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. And they will walk and not faint. God wants to look at us like eagles. He wants us to soar. God wants you to live above the snake line. Soaring for His honor and for His glory. Won't you do it? Will you stand with me? Our Heavenly Father, in closing today, I thank you. I thank you that you want to look at us as, as though we are eagles. And you want us to soar. You want us to rise above the way of the world. You want us to live above that spiritual snake line. And you want to use our lives to be a blessing to others. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us in our journey. Help us in our walk to be all that you would want us to be. Father, go before us. Grant unto us a wonderful week and make us a blessing to others. Use us in any way that you so desire. And, Father, for all that you do for us, we'll be sure to give unto you the praise and the glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name, our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. May God bless you. Remember, we're going to show a movie tonight. Heaven is for